This is uh, number five in our seven-part series, God's Money. View it vertically and uh, earn it honestly and utilize it effectively and uh, give it uh, generously. Uh, now, uh, from a couple of passages in the Gospels, uh, money, God's money. Everyone say God's money. That's what it is. It's God's. It's not ours. And so uh, we need to multiply it uh, faithfully. Now, let me ask you this. Has, have, have you ever had the experience of God's Word uh, just kind of taking you and shaking you? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I thought I saw it right, and then God's Word was like a detergent and just scrubbed out all the ways I was thinking about stuff. And yeah. I so want us to be that kind of church. We come from all of us different backgrounds and different experiences, but we're trying to gather together on what the Bible actually does say. That's why we spend so much time studying uh, the Scriptures, and I hope you'll be diligent to check everything that I'm uh, saying in this message uh, from the Scriptures. But uh, this, I got to say, this has kind of rocked me uh, this week, uh, just has, and in so much so that I've been talking to some of my friends, I'm like, no, you probably shouldn't come to church this week because when you hear this message, your head's going to explode. One, one of my friends said, um, yeah, I think I'll risk it. I was like, all right, then you should at least wear a helmet so we can like find the pieces when your head explodes. This, uh, uh, this passage and the other one we're going to turn to in a moment, honestly, um, it could really completely change uh, the way that you think. And uh, it needs to. It needs to. So let's take a moment and let's just uh, pray together. Father, I just want to confess uh, to you that certainly I have been guilty. Can I say that we have been guilty so often of making you in our own image, uh, forcing uh, you to conform to the way that we want you to be what's easiest for us, what's best for us, what's most comfortable for us. And I pray, Lord, uh, that you would uh, allow your word uh, to reshape our thinking. There is only one God. He has only one Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ would come and arrest our attention about the reality of your expectations for us. So we Submit ourselves to those purposes and pray that you would move powerfully through uh, your word. And now in Jesus' precious name, we pray together, don't we? Amen. 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 All right, so I had you open up, and, and uh, the passage is Luke uh, 19. And uh, let's start with this uh, thought. Hmm. Everyone take a deep breath. Here it is. Uh, Jesus Christ is a demanding boss to whom we must account. All right? And, and uh, so I'm going to need some scripture on that. Here it is. Uh, Luke 19, Jesus told uh, uh, a parable. I'm just going to kind of walk through this fairly quickly. You're going to be looking down the whole time, and I'm going to be too. Let's just all look at our Bibles. Uh, it starts in Luke 19, uh, verse 11. As they heard these things, that was his teaching about Zacchaeus and so on, um, he proceeded to tell a parable. So he says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. They're like, okay. And as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Now, I've taught on this before, but just look up here for a second. So what they thought was, like if you read the Old Testament, you see all these promises about what God's going to do in the future, and what they couldn't see was that it was actually describing what, what we now understand as the first and second advent of Christ, okay? So the first advent was uh, Christmas and his life and his death and his resurrection. And then a lot of the promises about his kingdom and his rule, uh, ultimately, uh, that's coming. That's in the second coming. Everyone say second coming. All right? And so we actually live between those two peaks. And in the Old Testament, when you're kind of looking uh, down the line, uh, it looks uh, sometimes in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in the Minor Prophets, like that's all one thing. Like you're looking across two mountain peaks, they look like they're the same, but when you actually get close, you see there's this big amount of space in between. That's where we are. We're at the space in between. Let's call this the church age, where our job is to uh, make disciples, okay? Uh, this is the age of the church. Uh, this is the time when we're supposed to be making disciples between Christ's first coming and his ultimate kingdom, uh, which is uh, yet to come. 
Now, with that as a backdrop, he said these things because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was, they didn't, they, they thought everything promised in the Old Testament is all coming now. They didn't understand God's plan to get the gospel to the whole world and bring in the Gentiles and make disciples of every nation. They supposed the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, now here's the parable. A nobleman, I'll just tell you straight up, the nobleman in the parable is Jesus. Anybody have a problem with Jesus as a nobleman? It's kind of understated, right? He'll be a king by the end of the story. Watch. A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Okay, sorry, back to my mountain peaks again. He goes into a far country to receive a kingdom and then return. And so there's this gap of time. Do you see it? There's a, there's a, there's a gap of time. Again, back to the text. We're learning. Everybody good with learning? Yeah. Learning at church. Hey, hey, welcome. <laughs> a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, this is before he left, he gave them a ten minas. Now, if you have a good study Bible, you'll see that a mina is about three months' wages. Quarter of a year, I don't know, I don't know. Let's call it 15K, all right? He gave them all 15K, a mina. And he said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens, that's all the people of the world, not his servants, but his citizens, hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to reign over us. Remember that. Anyway, when he returned, having received the kingdom, so now he's a king, he ordered, why did he order? Because he's the boss. Bosses get to give orders. He's the boss. He ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might, underline this in your Bible, know what they had gained. He gave them 15K. He left for a while. He came back. He said, now I told you to do business while I was gone. How much did you gain by doing business? Verse 16. The first came before him saying, Lord, your minna has made ten more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful and very... Can you imagine the guy gave you one and you show up with ten? That's a good day, right? Yeah. He's pretty fired up. Ten more. So he says, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful and very little... So in, in his mind, the 15K wasn't much. I gave you a little bit. I gave you one mina, 15K, three months wages, and uh, you made that into, tell me, 150K. You made it, multiplied it by 10. You've been faithful in a little bit. Because you've been faithful in very little, verse 17, you shall have authority over 10 cities. How much of an upgrade is that? We did a little research. Uh, Aurora has an annual budget of 18 million. Niles, 68 million. Chicago, 8.3 billion. <gasps> wait, 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 wait. Chicago, 8.3 billion. No. We, we don't, we, we, I, I don't know what the budget of these cities were. All I'm telling you is the guy made 15K into 150K, and now he gets, let's just say the average city was, I don't know, 25 mil. He gave him 10. Now he's, he made 15K into 150K. Now he's in charge of an annual budget of 250 million. Turn to your neighbor and say, nice promotion. <laughs> well done. You've been faithful in very little. You shall have authority over 10 cities. The second came saying, Lord, your minna has made five minas. Okay. 5X, it's nice. How many people take 5X on their... Uh, retirement right now. <laughs> Fast. And he said to him, and you're to be over five cities. <laughs> then another came saying, Lord, here's your minna, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. That's, that's where you're supposed to, hang on, that's where you're supposed to boo. Hang on. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> And he said, Lord, here's your minnow, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For, for I was afraid of you. What'd you do that for? I was afraid. Because you're a severe 
uh, man, the word severe there, um, austeros, uh, is from which we get our word austere, means uh, uncompromising, strict, rigorous, demanding. Got that? I might want to jot a couple of those down because it's Jesus is the nobleman. Uncompromising, strict, rigorous, demanding. That's where I got the point here. Jesus is a demanding boss to whom we must give an account. I was afraid, verse 21, because you're a severe man, you take what you did not deposit, you reap what you did not sow. What does that mean? Um, we're going to see another parable like this in a moment from Matthew 25. Um, I think it just means he has employees. Every, every field that gets harvested isn't one he planted personally. He has people that work for him. He's pretty serious about running his business. He said to him, I'll condemn you with your own words, wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, huh? Really, that's what, that's what you knew? Taking what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow? Implied, if you really thought that, verse 23, why then did you not put my money in the bank? And that my coming, I might have collected it with interest. Take the minna from him and give it to the one who has the ten. <gasps> now, people have a hard time with that. I mean, the guy already has ten. Now he's running like ten cities. He's in charge of the whole northwest suburbs. He doesn't need that guy's minna. I give him 15K. The guy, that's all the guy has. Take the minute from him and give it to the one who has 10. Everyone say, that's in the Bible. Say it. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 minutes. So the, even the people that were watching are like, is this right? He says, I tell you that to everyone has, everyone who has, get this, get this, get this, to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That might explain some things. Does that explain some things for you in your life? Yeah. And, then, and then check verse 27. This is Jesus Christ. But as for those enemies of mine, remember verse 14, the citizens that hated him, didn't want him to, but as for those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Let's go back to our peaks. So where's this, where this happening exactly? Okay, where this is happening is this is happening in the second advent. This is happening at the end before the kingdom. This is the separation of the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the lake of fire, and the crystal sea and eternal paradise. This is the final accounting. And Jesus Christ says, yeah, in regard to those people that didn't want me to reign over them, bring them here and uh, kill them in front of me. Um, I want to watch. Jesus Christ is a demanding boss to whom we must give an account. You know, when I study, I always try to make sure that I'm studying what other godly people have said about the scriptures. I don't want to stand up here and, and you know, say something that is of private interpretation. We should submit ourselves to 2,000 years of biblical scholarship. It was a little troubling to pick up a respected Bible commentator this week who said this, the nobleman's anger is not intended to attribute such behavior to Jesus himself. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is absolutely intended to attribute that behavior to Jesus Christ. He's a demanding boss to whom we must account. And the Jesus Christ that we're going to meet someday, all right, is not going to be the Jesus Christ weeping over Jerusalem. How often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks. That's not what's coming. Revelation 19 says that the Jesus Christ is returning. It says that his eyes are like a flame of fire. It says that out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which he will strike the nations. It says that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. 
Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 12.29 says, our God is a consuming fire. All right? 1 Corinthians 3 says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You're going. Well, I don't know. You're going. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive a, a reward according to what he's done in this world, whether good or bad. Forgiven of our sin, but then rewards based on what we've done. You're going to account. Amen. You're going to account. You say, well, what's, 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 what's the minna represent? It represents everything God's given you to do what God wants done. Some people say, well, it represents time. Well, but, you know, I, I, everyone got the same amount. I think probably I, I couldn't narrow it down to one thing. It certainly includes money and time and talent and abilities and opportunity and situation and uh, gifts and, and it, it's everything. It's, it's, it's the bundle of what God has given to you and he's a demanding boss, and he expects a return on his investment. Bank on that. You say, well, I don't, I don't know if I really like hearing that. Isn't it awesome to come to church and, 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 and sit in a room where I don't, I don't give a, 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 a huge care about what you want to hear because I love you, and if you're any kind of, those of you who are parents, if you're any kind of parent at all, you know that sometimes you have to say stuff that people don't necessarily want to hear because you love your kids and you want to help them get to a better place. Now, warning God's people is in the best traditions of 2,000 years of biblical Christianity, and you need to be warned about the Jesus Christ that you're going to meet. He's a demanding boss, and we're going to have to account for what we've done. Now go with me over to Matthew 25, Matthew 25, and note this second thing, loved ones, Jesus Christ expects a return on his investment. Do you understand? He doesn't, he doesn't just, bro, he doesn't just want you to give back, well you gave me one, I gave you one back. I hid it in the ground, and I didn't lose it, and here it is. Turn to your neighbor and say, that will not be good enough. That will not be good enough. Do you understand? He expects a return. Now, I know this because I, when I have the privilege of speaking other places, there's no place for me like our church family. Nothing comes close to it in my life, but sometimes I get to preach other places, and I, never, I almost never prepare a new sermon. I always take something from what we've done, and then I take that and just, you know, fly that plane somewhere else. Most preachers do that. Jesus was a preacher. And when you preach the same message somewhere else, you adjust little parts of it to suit the point you want to make or the people you're talking to. I go like this if that makes sense. So Matthew 25 is the same sermon with some changes. It's not minas anymore. It's called talents, and um, everybody doesn't get the same amount. Now people get different amounts. And you'd agree that we get some things. Uh, we don't all get the same. Wouldn't you agree? Some people have more gifts than others. Some people have more opportunity than others. Some people get saved later in life. Some people grew up in a Christian home, had that privilege. Um, to whom much is given, much is required. And so now that we're in Matthew 25, it's going to just change uh, a little bit. Start with me in verse 14. Same sermon, adjusted slightly. For it, that's the kingdom of heaven, look at verse 1, 25, 1, the kingdom of heaven will be like, repeating that, for it will be like, also like, the kingdom of heaven will also be like, verse 14, a man going on a journey. Oh, I've heard this sermon before. Remember the guy, he goes on the, he goes on the journey, and then he comes back, remember, remember? What the thought that came into my mind is, I'm just too good at sounding stupid. <laughs> Come on. 
For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. Whose property is it? Say God's money. Okay, the nobleman still owns it even though he gave it to you. Entrusted to them his property. Now notice, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. To each according to his ability. Now, I don't know who he was preaching to on this day, but a talent makes a minna look like a joke. Okay? A talent is 20 years wages. 20 years wages. These, these boys got a serious opportunity here. One guy gets five. I'm not super great with math, so if one talent is 20 years wages, then five talents is... It's what you could make if your career lasted for a hundred years. So one guy gets five, one guy gets two, 40 years. To another one, this is interesting, to each according to his ability. If he gives more gifts, if he gives more time, if he gives more opportunity, he expects a return on his investment. Now, verse 16, he who received the five talents went at once and traded with them. Now, that doesn't mean he went to the Chicago Mercantile. It just means that he did business with them. He bought and sold. He, this is a message about multiplication. He traded with them, and he made five talents. The dude sets out with 100 years' wages, and he comes back with, tell me, 200 years' wages. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received, don't forget about your booze here, hang on. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, that's the problem. Look up here for a sec. That is kind of the problem, isn't it? It's a long time. I committed my life to Jesus Christ when I was seven and and uh, I'm not that far from looking at 50 years of following. 45 down, five to go. It's a long time between, for many of us, when you get the assignment and when you have to account. Now, I'm telling you that's a problem because it makes you think it's not coming. Sometimes the longer the delay, the more you tend to think that it's not coming, but it is coming. And, and uh, sometimes the longer it goes on, the more reckless you get. I did a little bit of snowmobiling with a friend uh, this uh, winter. And before I left for the day, my uh, wife, my good wife, uh, said, um, uh, hey, be careful on that snowmobile. We don't need any drama. <laughs> Everyone say good wife. So, I mean, I was really on that program, and for the first couple of hours, I drove really carefully. I mean, I was so careful, but but fact is, I mean, it's fun to go fast. <laughs> and, and so I started going faster. Then I found, did you know that on a snowmobile, if you hit a snowdrift, just those things actually um, can fly. <laughs> and this also is great fun. But incredibly, after about three or four hours, I got to the uh, place where um, it was almost time to quit. And, and the buddy that I was with, he said, well, we should go in now. And I said, no, no, come on, just a half an hour more. And I, I, I mean, there had been no drama, no problems of any kind. But that last half hour, I ran into a tree. I, I tried to turn it too fast, and I got thrown off and hurt my foot. I, the longer you go, without incident, the more you start to feel invincible. And it's the same in the kingdom. Some of you have known Christ for 10 or 20, 30 years. You've been living selfishly. You've been living foolishly. You're not prepared to show a return on his investment. And the longer you go, the more you start to think that you're going to get away with that and you're not. That's what church is about today. Back to verse 19. 
Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. There it is. Expects a return on his day. Settled accounts with them. What did I give you? What do you have? Verse 21. His master's, um, or pardon me, verse 20. He who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, <laughs> Master, you delivered uh, to me five talents. Here I've made uh, five talents more. Now, um, I've got to just kind of act this out because the word order uh, in the Greek is really interesting. I wish I had like a bag with five uh, talents in it. Oh, as it turns out, I do. And, <laughs> and he says... He says, you gave me five talents. Now, this would be a, a better illustration if I had another bag. <laughs> it's interesting. He says, master, you gave me five. Five more. And the key word in the phrase in the original language is, in between is the word look. And so he's like, master, you gave me five Look, five more. Is he, is he fired up? He's fired up. Why is he fired up? Because he knows the master. He knows he expects a return on his investment. And he's been pretty fired up to say, here's what you gave me. Here's what I did with it. That was a, that was a really good day for him. And it just sort of repeats for the guy with two um, but hang on for a second. I felt the Lord really dealing with me when I read about the guy with two. In regard to the five, his master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'll set you over much. We don't find out is this cities. We don't know. But that was in the other sermon. Enter into the joy of your master, the joy of multiplied opportunity, he also had the two talents. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have. You gave me two. Look! Two more! Now, some of you at church this weekend, listening right now on one of our campuses, you feel like, I just didn't, I didn't get, I didn't get what Meredith Andrews has. I didn't. I didn't get what Jeff Donaldson or Dave Learned or Mo or some of our, I didn't, I didn't get, maybe you have someone that you've kind of had your eye on and you're like, well, you know, I, if I'd been given what they were given, I would do more. But see, what's really interesting is he doesn't expect you to return beyond a reasonable return on what he gave you. You didn't come to know Christ till you're in your 40s if you, if you, haven't been given uh, certain gifts like other people have. It's interesting. What they're commended for is for their faithfulness with what they were given. Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I've made two more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your uh, master. Now... Um, Jesus Christ expects a return on his investment. Jesus Christ expects a return on his investment. Did you write that down? Yeah. I'm not kidding around. He's not kidding around. You need to have a return on his investment. Now, um, I understand uh, that some people are going to say, well, James, 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 go ahead. James. This, this is, they're like, James, James, this isn't about money. Well, here, here's what I'm going to say to that. You say, well, what, what, is the, what is the talent? What, is the, what does the talent represent? Well, um, it represents everything that God's given you. So, yes, money, but much more than that. Much more than that. It represents time and abilities and opportunity. Look, look at it represents salvation. Okay? You've been given salvation. If he gave you salvation, is there anyone you can point to who has salvation because you got salvation? It really doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's, I wanted to say this carefully, so I wrote it down. Money is neither so important as to be the primary meaning of the text, nor so trivial as to be excluded. 
Talent equals the totality of what God has given you for his purposes, of which money is a part. And because this is a series about money, I'm going to apply it to money, but I don't want someone to say to me, James, it's about way more. I understand that. It's about all of those things. It's about all of it. It's about everything that God's given you. And we wanted to teach about victory over finances and God's money in this series, so that's how we're going to imply it. Now, I want to use a big financial term here because, you know, I'm, it matters to me. I want you to be a little impressed, so. Um, uh, yeah, the technical uh, industry term is, uh, it's ROI. i show a little ROI, which stands for, I don't know if you know this, it stands for return on... How many, put up your hand if you already knew what that stood for. I'm not as big as I thought. Okay, well, if you know what it is, uh, do you know that Jesus Christ, your master, is looking for some ROI? He's looking for some return on his investment, all right? You say, James, when you say that Jesus Christ expects a return on his investment, he's looking for some ROI. What do you have in mind exactly? Jot these uh, four things down. And number one, he's for sure looking for a financial return. He is looking for that. He knows how much he's given you, and he's looking for a return. If he gave you a minute, if he gave you one talent, two talents, five talents, he's looking for a return. Kathy and I have a goal to, at the end of our life, be able to give a back to the Lord everything that we have received, to take it, use what uh, is needed for use and multiply what remains toward the goal of giving back to the Lord at the end of our life, everything that he's given to us. I totally want to be that. Look, you, five, look, five more. That's the, I want to be that person. And, and uh, so for sure it means a financial return, uh, but not just, everyone say not just that. The second thing is a family return. Family return. If he's given you a marriage, if he's given you children, you be on that. Nothing is more. I ran into a pastor this week that uh, has been a friend of mine uh, for many years, just a local a pastor, and uh, we just had a wonderful time rejoicing together about God's grace and favor on his family and on my family. And he reminded me of a time that we were uh, together and we wept and prayed uh, for each of our children, and, and uh, I'm, I'm just telling you, parents, those kids, that they belong to God, and he expects a return on his investment. Those of you who are here at church this week and your kids aren't walking with God, your kids don't love God, you don't let go of that. Don't give up on that. Don't despair in that. Persevere, pray, work, trust don't, don't, don't ever entertain the notion that your kids aren't going to love God and serve God more effectively than you have. Don't ever give up on that. He expects a return. ROI, financial return, family return. A fruit return. There's the fruit of Jesus in me, the fruits of the Spirit, love. Are you more loving than you used to be? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, self-control. These are the fruits of Jesus in me. He wants a return. He gave you the Holy Spirit. He gave you the Word of God. He wants to see the likeness of Christ produced in your life and then through your life. Uh, fruit. Obviously, obviously, fruit is multiplication. You don't grow an apple tree and pick one apple. There should be multiplication and there should be people that are following Jesus because you're following Jesus. Financial return, family return, fruit return. And then this is real important, a faithfulness return. He expects you to be on the job when he comes back. All of these good servants were still on it. And, and I just want to say to some of you, Maybe you've had a hard week or a hard year. You're still here. You're still here. Maybe something's happened that's dashed your hopes or broke your heart. You're still here. And that's awesome. 
And that shows God at work in your life. And part of your return is that you will give back to him your life at the end, still belonging to him, still loving him, still serving him, still faithful to him. Don't defect. Don't quit. Don't walk away. Don't, if you fall, what? Tell me. Get up. Preach to the church. Preach to the church. If you fall, what? Get up, Get up again and persevere in that. All of those are ROIs. And then this, I have no joy in saying this, none. Jesus Christ is a demanding boss to whom we must account. Jesus Christ expects a return on his investment. Jesus Christ says that failure to multiply is wicked and lazy. Notice then from the text. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you'd be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what's yours. But his master answered him, you wicked, slothful servant. Wicked, evil in behavior, slothful, evil in effort. You tried hard at wrong things, and not hard enough at right things. You tried hard at wrong things, wicked servant, and you didn't try hard enough at right things, lazy servant. Look up here first for a second. I don't want to pound you. I don't know that Jesus raised his voice when he said this. As I understand the Lord, I think you're the one that loses. I, I would see it as a tender-hearted pleading. You wicked, lazy servant. I told you how everything works. I told you what it's like in my kingdom. Why did you live like you didn't know this? I told you you're going to have to account to me someday for what I gave you. Why'd you keep flipping pages on the calendar like I didn't expect any return on what I gave you? I do respect her. Like, it's, 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 I feel myself getting energized and wanting to motivate you, but I feel myself holding back because I don't want to imply a, a tone that I can't, supply from the text. I just believe that God loves you and he wants you to live in the joy of the master. The joy of the master is the multiplication. And if you're living apart from that, you're missing so much. Why do people do it? Interesting, also in both versions of this sermon, what's the reason that the guy gave, why he hid it, why he buried it, why? And both times he's like, I was afraid, I was afraid. Jot this down. Fear distorts my view of Jesus and forfeits faithful multiplication. Fear is the culprit. Fear is the culprit. Notice something also that doesn't change between Luke 19 and Matthew 25. Both times the guy who put it in a napkin or in the other sermon version uh, put it in a hole. Uh, in either uh, instance, uh, what would you do that for? And what's the answer both times? Tell me. I was afraid. I was afraid. Now, is he making an excuse? Yes. Is, is he not really afraid, but he's just acting like he's afraid? Is he just making a lame ex excuse? It's, it's pizza's fault I'm fat. <laughs> right? Is he just making an excuse that, that seems ridiculous? Or, or um, no, I would suggest to you that I think, uh, I think he really is afraid. He's afraid of risking. He says, I know what you're like. You, you, you pick up where you didn't lay down. You harvest where you didn't. You have people that work for you, and you expect them to work hard, and you expect them to show a return on the investment. I know what you're like. And I was afraid I would lose it. I was afraid I would blow it. I wasn't willing to risk it, I, which, which, by the way, by the way, um, jot this down. Better to try and fail than not to try. Better to try and fail than not to try. We say that here at Harvest to our staff. You can try and fail, but you can't fail to try. Trying and failing, we're patient and merciful and loving with people who try and fail, but not super patient with fail to try. Life's too short to phone it in. Are you listening? Life's just too short to phone it in. You've got you to gotta put your best effort out there. He's like, oh, I was, I, I was afraid. I, I, I. Notice how fear, uh, um, fear of losing leads to stockpiling. 
And fear of losing leads to a distorted view of Jesus. He's like, well, well you're, you're harsh. No, I'm not harsh, but I am uh, demanding and I expect a return on my investment. Well, but you're unfair. No, no, I'm not unfair, but I am demanding and I do expect a return on my investment. Well, 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 I, I think you kind of ripped me off because you, you only gave me one talent and then you gave the other guy two and, and that other guy, you gave him five. Well, what you did with it actually kind of shows the wisdom that I only wasted one on you. So, this fear of risk thing is a really big thing, and I want to um, show you a little chart here, five views on financial multiplication. I want to show you how risk kind of plays into this, okay? So, uh, first of all, there's the slacker. I hope you're not a slacker. We talked about that in the second message. Slacker doesn't really risk anything because he doesn't work very hard. He doesn't have anything to show for it because he's just like setting world records in video games and nonsense. He's not actually doing very much uh, with his life. So um, he's a slacker. And uh, teach your kids to work. Thank God for kids that are hard workers. Uh, but the guy who does work, he gets a little bit. Maybe he's never had anything. Maybe his parents never had anything. And what he gets, now he wants to hoard it. And then what are you looking at? You stay away from my little pile. This is mine and I earned it. And, but it's not yours, it's God's. And, and you have a scarcity mentality. He can put a lot more in your hands. If you stop gripping it so tightly, there's one who scatters yet increases all the more. Okay, so hoarder doesn't want to risk. I could lose it. And that's what we see here. And then uh, in the middle is what I would call the investor. The investor does live with a little bit of risk. And, and I'm going to tell you some things to invest in here in a minute. You say, well, will there be a risk involved? Well, um, better to try and fail than not to try. And, and an investor lives with uh, a measured, studied, reasonable amount of risk. But when the risk becomes too much, then you become like a gambler. And a gambler is, well, no one ever taught me this, and I, I got to cut some corners, and I got to get there faster. And whether it's lottery tickets that we already talked about, or if it sounds too good to be true, tell me. It is. Okay. So not that much risk. And then worse even than the gambler is the cheater. And cheaters don't what? Win. Cheaters don't prosper. They don't win. You're, you're not going to beat God. He's not, you're going to reap what you've sown. And if you're a liar, if you don't pay your taxes, if you do faulty business deals, if you take cash on the side, all right, that's not going to a good place. Okay, that's too much risk. God won't allow you to get ahead. All right, it's never right to do wrong. Never. So those are five views. Now I'd like to see us as a church here kind of in the middle. Okay? Uh, a moderate amount of risk. You say, well, where should I start? Start here. Now you see my Bible sitting down here. Okay? You can see this differently than I do. Um, this is just counsel now. I believe it's godly counsel. I believe it's good counsel. But it's not thus says the Lord. Clear? Um, we can see this differently. But I believe, and uh, some of the best uh, financial leaders in our church believe, that your first goal uh, should be a home ownership. Home ownership. Um, you say, well, but everything kind of crashed a couple years ago. That's fine. Um, go ahead and extrapolate that back over the last 50 years, and you will find out that home ownership is a, a very, well, but I just don't think that, I'll, I'll say more about uh, uh, debt in a moment, but generally speaking, over the long period of, over the long haul, a home is a, an appreciating asset, and you should seek to get into a condo or a town home or a, whatever you can afford within your means, all right? And, and there's tax deductions involved in that. If you're a minister, there's even more tax deductions involved in that. It makes it a more shrewd investment. But whatever is available to you, you should um, seek to put uh, whatever is shrewd into a home toward the goal uh, of multiplication and ultimately being debt-free and not even having a mortgage. Okay? Now, um, in that regard, uh, Brian Shepler, who's on the videos at the end of the message, uh, sent an email this week. It was an interesting, it was a white paper that was written that said that uh, people who do market timing, that's the gambler, not the investor, jumping in and out of the market, trying to catch it at the right time and get it up, catch it at the right time. He said that statistics show that even though they report big quarters and even big years with market timing, um, nobody, basically nobody beats 
Get it in. Keep it there. Don't mess with it. Over the long haul, that's how you do it. So get into home ownership. Get into your 403B or whatever your pension plan is, your savings, mutual funds. Um, get a financial advisor. I don't know how to handle these things. Um, I have a financial advisor. You should have a financial advisor, someone who's giving you wisdom. That's what uh, was being announced this weekend, that we're going to be training people in our church who are professional at giving the rest of us a counsel in these regards. And this is not wrong, and this is not unspiritual. We have a master who's going to be looking for a return on his investment at every level. And so I believe that there's wisdom in what you're being exhorted about. Now, let me just show you how a little bit becomes a lot. Check out this uh, chart. If you started when you were 25 and you started saving even $25 a month over 40 years, that would become 66 grand. And uh, if you started saving $100 a month over 40 years from 25 to 65, that would become that. If you started saving a, a $500 a month, that's what you'd have from 25 you believe that? And if you started, say, say you started saving, uh, I couldn't save more than 500. Well, save 500 for the first 20 years, and then as you start to get your house paid off, uh, save 1,000 a month for the next 20 years, that's where you'd be at 65. And if you saved 1,000, just $12,000 a year, if you saved $1,000 a month for all of that time, that's how much you'd have over 40 years. That's just at 7% interest, all right? And the way that saving compounds, here's the key, Live on less than you make. If you're like, well, we got a, we, I sold my old surfboard for $100. What can I buy? What can I buy? What can I buy? All right? Um, that's never going anywhere good. All right? You have to live on less than you make. Start setting aside in a home, in a mutual fund, an appreciating asset, and, and beyond what you give, and get to the place where, now, I understand that some people are like, I can't start saving money. My, my heart will get caught up in that. And, and this is a really important sentence. If you want to understand what I believe about money, jot this down. Because the person who's really afraid, I mean like terrified, what they do is, is they get a little bit of money in their hands and they're like, this is going to get me. This is going to get my heart. And they're like, get it away from me. And they, 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 and this is everywhere. Jot this down. Don't renounce income. Steward it. All right? It's not an evil to be renounced. It's a danger to get victory over, like all temptation. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. All right? Don't renounce it. Steward it. Show an increase for your master. Now, I understand some people, well, I just don't agree. Jesus didn't have a mutual fund. <laughs> Really, really, are you even capable of a nuanced discussion? Well, Jesus, Jesus didn't own a house. Jesus, Jesus. All right, first of all, if we're going to have this discussion, you need to be wearing sandals. <laughs> well, but Jesus said he didn't even have a place to lay his head down. All right, so then if you have a pillow, you're living in sin. Is that what you're saying? It wearies me people that are not thinking. This is the most important sentence in the message today. All right? We don't teach Jesus' economic practice. We practice Jesus' economic teaching. Could you just think about that, please? All right? Well, but Jesus, he didn't have any buildings. His ministry was three years. He was not married. He had no children. And when he was running short, look in uh, Matthew uh, chapter um, 17, verse 27, when they didn't have any money for the temple tax, Jesus said to Peter, hey, uh, here's what you do. I'll just read it to you. Matthew 17, 27, uh, Jesus said, um, go to the sea, cast a hook in, take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that. Give it to them for me and yourself. All right, so if you're a little short this month, <laughs> spend the little bit you have on a fishing pole. Go down to Lake Michigan. Really? 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 
we got to do it like Jesus. We, look at, look at. We walk in the steps of his behavior. We walk in the steps of his love and his grace and his mercy. And I want to show mercy toward you if you've been guilty of that kind of foolish thinking. I can probably make this a little bit clearer. Take out the word economic from that and insert the word marriage. This will make sense to you. We don't teach Jesus' marriage practice. We practice Jesus' marriage teaching. Otherwise, none of us should be married. Okay? Does that make sense to you? Or, or, or take out the word economic and the word marriage. Put in the word ministry. We don't teach Jesus' ministry practice. In other words, we should get rid of all of our facilities and we should all go get 12 people, um, half of them fishermen, and we should begin to circulate in our neighborhood and uh, doing the best miracles we know how to do. You say, well, why would we do that? Well, we wouldn't because we don't teach his ministry practice. We practice his ministry teaching. Okay, do you get it? So we don't teach Jesus economic practice. We practice his teaching. He said, set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. He said, so is he who is not rich toward God. Uh, he talked about the greatest joy in life is the pearl of great price for which we would forsake everything. We don't allow things to get hold of our heart. We receive the warning about being rich toward God. But he expects a return on his investment. And this is as serious as serious gets. And renouncing money because of its danger is not good stewardship. It's just not. Which leads to this next part of the text. Thanks for sticking with me here. So, you wicked, lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. You ought to have invested my money with the bankers. Really? Really? Jesus is recommending working with the bank? Correct. It's right there in the text. Just read it yourself. You ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So, good debt leverages and bad debt destroys multiplication. Now, some people are going to have a hard time with this. Stick with me, I'm almost done. There is uh, some kinds of good debt. Um, uh, this guy should have put his money, he should have been in bank partnership to get some kind of increase at the very least. Maybe he thought one wasn't enough, but he should have done something to show an increase. But I, I just have to say that this teaching that all debt's bad, all debt's bad. No, no, um, all consumer debt is bad. All depreciating assets. The Ron Blue Company that's really been advising us on this series, they borrowed uh, money at uh, several intervals to grow their business. If you have a landscaping company and you have one lawnmower and one, trow one, one hoe and one worker, and you're like, well, I got so many clients coming in. If we got another lawnmower, but I don't have enough money for another lawnmower, but if you could find an investor, or if you could find a bank that was willing to help you, if you can increase your revenue, if you, if you own a Dairy Queen, and, which that's just a great thought by itself. <laughs> and you're like, man, we're just kicking it over here at this Dairy Queen, and I'm just so good at running it. Well, well, um... That's called multiplication. That's called doing business till I come. And by the way, that's not just expected of us on this lower level of monetary things. I remember when we were in a high school, 500 people, and we bought this building. By the time they loaned us back enough to finish this half of the room, our church uh, had uh, $3.3 million of debt. And at the time, people were like, like Jesus didn't own a church building. And uh, no, but we were shrewder than that kind of foolishness. And uh, I'm so glad that we did multiply, and we've tried to multiply again and multiply again. And now, of course, our ministry through church planning, Walk in the Word, is around the world. And by the way, we're not getting ready to roll that up. That we're just going to seek to keep multiplying until He comes. All right? Life's too short to say, well, we've got a nice little group of people here. It's enough. It's never enough. And wasn't it awesome to see these people getting baptized this weekend? Don't those stories justify stretching out further and trying to reach more? You say, well, are there any parameters there? Well, first of all, um, 
we would say, and this is what we say, uh, never more than 30% of your gross income ever for debt, ever for any reason. That's the little nuanced uh, argument for legitimate usage of debt in a organizational business context. However, everyone say however. Um, here's the main point, bad debt, bad debt. Bad debt is not an appreciating asset, not something that's used to expand uh, the growth of the organization. Bad debt is consumer debt. Consumer debt is buying stuff I don't need with money I don't have to impress people I don't like, okay? And I, I got four pairs of shoes and I got stuff I don't need and, and the worst is if you buy that on a credit card and you incur consumer debt, do you have any idea how much you're paying? You spend $1,000 on stuff. Look at this chart here. You spend $1,000 on stuff. Here's what you pay for that $1,000 of consumer goods on a credit card at 18% over five years. Over 10 years, you pay 4,000, almost five grand. Over 15 years, you pay four, 13 and a half. Over 20 years, you pay almost $35,000. That's on $1,000 of consumer debt. You're like, well, but I've already paid off my shoes. Yeah, but if you've been carrying the $1,000 of consumer debt for something else, you still are incurring that kind of, and that's 1,000. The average American has over $7,000 of consumer debt. And when you take out the people, we don't have any consumer debt. And when you take out the people that don't have any consumer debt, the average American that has consumer debt has over $15,000 of debt. That's your increase right there going over the falls. That's the money you're supposed to have to do business, to show multiplication, to produce return for your master. Consumer debt is the drunk driving of personal finance. That's why when Dave Ramsey was talking to us a couple of weeks ago, he said, get out of debt, get out of debt, get out of debt. Go crazy, carry your lunch, walk to work, sell what you have, get out of debt. Get out of debt, get out of debt. Go so crazy, he said, he said, that your kids, when you're selling so much stuff, your kids are gonna think they're next. <laughs> All right? Get out of debt. Get on top of this instead of having this on top of you. Can't say it any more clearly than that. Good debt leverages and bad debt destroys multiplication. It just destroys it. Proverbs 22.7 is the scripture that says that the, uh, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Okay, that's true. That's not true in the way as if Solomon is just observing it. He's not saying that any debt of any kind is sin. He's just an observation. Back then in 2 Kings 4 when the widow lost her husband, she said, and the creditors are coming to take my two children to be their slaves. Back then, there was debtor's prison, and, and they could sell your children to pay your debt. That's bad, but I wonder if our permissive society isn't worse, the way that the banks control everybody through consumer debt. Without question, many, many people listening to me right now are enslaved to bad debt, and you need to get out of debt, get out of debt, do what you have to do. Nothing is more important than that financially. Nothing will put you on a better path than making radical decisions now to get financially free, okay? And then you're like, why, why would I do all this? Here's why, and this is just the awesome conclusion. Faithful multiplication leads to greater joy and opportunity. It's hard to miss it in the text. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The joy of the master is the joy of multiplication. Um, we're living this. Our church is living this. Why aren't you living this? I had a man come up to me who's been coming to our church since the beginning this morning and tears in his eyes. He said after the first service, I wish I'd learned this 20 years ago. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I didn't know this 20 years ago. And I talked to a whole group of young people on this side of the worship center, a small group. And I said, you know how blessed you are to be hearing this now? Okay, cut up your credit cards, get out of debt. Your master expects a return on his investment. He's a demanding boss. And failure to multiply is wicked and lazy. All right? Good debt has an acceptable place and an appreciating asset or an increased cash flow, a moderate amount of risk as an investor. Not as a cheater, not as a gambler 
but not a hoarder or a slacker either. Get in the middle there and get to work and show an increase for your master in everything that he's given you, from your money to your talents to your abilities to your salvation itself. Jesus expects a return on his investment. And if he gets it, you're going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Watch this video. Well, hey, you can see we're back in the studio now with our friends Brian Scheffler and Ron Blue. And I'm praying that this uh, teaching on God's money, multiply it faithfully, has been an encouragement to you. But we don't want to stop just with the proclamation of the truth for our head and hearts. We want to make sure that by application, it's showing up in our lives. So, Brian, let's, uh, let's fire some questions at Ron here. Sure. Ron, is Jesus really insistent, like a taskmaster, that we get a return on our investment? Well, I think of the parable of the talents. He, the one who had the one talent said, I knew that you were a hard taskmaster. And he's talking about the Savior there. So, Oh, Jesus, please. He, he's so mild and meek. How, how could he be hard? Well, then in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, if your eye causes you to sin, uh, pluck it out. If you're, that's hard. That's hard. And I think if you read the Sermon on the Mount, you say, my goodness, the, the standards here, what they do is they force me back to dependence upon him and on the Holy Spirit. Yes. Right. So, yes, he is, but he also provides the way of, uh, of escape, if you will, from so, that being a So, not to fear him in no. that sense as a hard taskmaster, but realize that the expectation he has is real mm-hmm. and go to him for the help he provides to meet those standards. And he wants it to be hard and he wants to meet him himself. I can't yeah. even handle my sin problem. Yeah. He handles that. So, yes, he's a hard taskmaster, but then he turns right around and says, uh, ask, seek, and knock. And I'll help you. And I'll help you. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Really, really phenomenal. Well, on this matter of multiplication, um, let me just say, um, do you see it in other places? Obviously in the parable of the talents, but, I mean, do we just pull one passage out here, or does Jesus really expect multiplication? Well, I, I see it throughout uh, Scripture. Um, I think Ephesians 3.20 to me is an important verse that he says he'll do beyond all you can ask, think, or even imagine. So if I can think about it, it's beyond that. Yeah, it's even more that he's going to do. It's, it's even more than that. So the reality is that he, he wants me to have an abundant life. Let's shift on to the discussion of hoarding and people just keeping things for themselves. What are some of the fears, Ron, you see that cause people to, to hoard? Well, I think one is that they don't trust God. I, I would say that if you're depending on God, you always have enough. Uh, I mean... Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 8, which say he's going he's to always meet every need. In fact, I, I went through that verse. I took the every and the always and the XLs. He's going to meet every need that I have. So if I'm depending on God, I'm always going to have enough. Mm-hmm. But if I'm depending on my money, I'm never going to have enough. That's right. So that's why people hoard is because they don't believe that they'll ever have enough. Is there a fear that's driving that too? Like if I'm thinking about multiplication from the message today and I have this little bit that I've saved um, it seems to me that I have to protect that a little bit like the guy that hit it in the ground and I'm not willing to do, you know, Jesus said, do business until I come. And, and, and so just help us with the fear of, of um, seeking um, some kind of a return for our master. Well, uh, I think he wants me to see his super abundant provision and he wants me to understand that he is the one who will always meet all of my needs all of the time. Yeah. Absolutely will. And I think that that's where, but he, but he does that in retrospect as opposed to prospect. I've got to take the step of obedience okay. before then he will meet the need. So this scarcity versus abundance mentality is a really important principle to be wrestling with. I think it's uh, blasphemous mm. to have a scarcity mentality because it says my God cannot create. I mean, all I have to do is look at the stars, look at the earth. I look at the uh, diversity of flowers here at springtime, and I say, my God can create. Dr. Bright always used to say, it all depends on your view of God. Yeah. And it flows from from that, doesn't it? Everything flows from that. Fantastic. Well, what are we going to do to make this practical this week? Well, we've got another diagnostic for you to go through. This one will just be 10 simple questions. The first five are around just assessing where you are in this area of uh, multiplying it faithfully. And then down below, how you're implementing some of the principles, again, uh, that we've talked about today. So uh, available online, just download those, download those and include them in the rest of the uh, diagnostics you've completed so far in the series. All right, catch up if you've fallen behind and uh, do the diagnostic this week on Multiply It Faithfully. Uh, next time, a big subject, uh, surprising for some, but right in God's Word. 
Uh, enjoy it carefully. Mm -hmm. Let's all stand together for prayer. Father, thank you for these hungry hearts that have uh, listened to a message that in many regards is not easy to hear. But we would uh, pray and ask that this uh, delay, as it seems, this extended time between our knowing you and our meeting you, we pray that this would not lead to laxity in us or somehow the failure to experience your direct accountability would cause us to think in any way that it isn't coming. And I pray that you would cause us to live this week in a way that reflects our awareness that you are insistent, you are demanding in that sense, you, you do uh, want to see that we have done much with what you have given to us and you have given us much. Even the one with the least has much and would have more if they would seek to faithfully multiply it. So uh, break our addiction to seeing uh, things as a source of happiness and cause us instead to see that the great joy of our master is found in, in multiplying and bringing return on everything that you've given to us. And help us, uh, Father, to be that kind of church, always filled with faith, always expecting your provision, knowing that you are able. Help us as we go out this week and seek to live courageously in obedience to these scriptures. Help us as we fill out this diagnostic and discuss it in our small groups. In all of it, we pray that you'd be at work in our lives to will and to do of your good pleasure. We pray this in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are loved. Have a good week.